those boards that click. <laughs> yeah, I know, I wish. All right, you're all set. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, glad that everyone's uh, here today. I just want to uh, second uh, Megan's comment about internships. I actually spent 15, uh, or mentorships, I spent 15 months being an intern while I was in college. I think it really helped propel my, my career. And uh, when I was uh, teaching at the University of Colorado, I would really promote the internship programs. Now, my talk is about processor engineering. And this is something that I've been involved with, uh, uh, hard to say, but almost 37 years. But uh, I think we're entering a new golden age. And so uh, I would like to talk to you about that and see if I can get some interest in uh, um, you looking at, at a career as a processor engineer. Now, first of all, I want to give you a little history. Back in the uh, 1980s when I started, it seemed like every company in the world was doing their own custom processor. And here's a, a, a group of uh, names and companies that had uh, processor design, they had architectures, some uh, were open and being designed by other people. And you can tell a lot of them today don't really exist as a, what you think as a processor company. And I put ARM sort of down on the bottom left because 1985 is really when our, or, or the architecture came out. And so they were really a small company back then. They're not what you think they are today, back in 1985. And then I have uh, another company on the right called Soulborn Computer. That's the company I was working for, and we were designing a custom processor. And we were getting ready to tape out our first processor, and that's when Sun Microsystems came to us and said uh, to our company that no one's going to ever buy your custom processor, and that's not what you want to hear as a startup, right? And But they had good logical reasons, and the, and the reason was it's software now. We're entering an area where software is going to be the dominant expense, not the hardware. And that unless you can guarantee your processor will be out there for 10 to 20 years, no one will port their software to your architecture. So Soulborn became the very first uh, uh, Spark compatible uh, 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 processor in the world. So we actually switched our, to our architecture to Spark. And they were right, because what happened was, you see in the next decade, that we really went down just to a handful of architectures or places to get a job. You know, previously I had all this list of companies and there's a bigger list than that. So it was easy to find a job to be a processor engineer. But when you enter the 1990s and move into the 2000s, what you find out that as we consolidated architectures, the number of places to get a job were a lot less uh, opportunity for uh, uh, processor design. So processor design, once again, is the design of the, the uh, core unit that runs almost every product that you can think of, you know, like your computer, you got the Intel processor, uh, you know, Apple has their, uh, I've got which uh, uh, processor uh, uh, rev revision they're at, uh, Google has their pixel engine and so forth. All those are processor engineers or, or, or examples of a processor core that are done by processor engineering. And now, Back in the, uh, uh, around 2015, if I had a student ask, ask me to be a processor engineer, I, you know, I would actually support them. But I'd say there's a limited number of opportunities because there's a limited number of companies actually doing processor engineering. But then we had this, uh, then we had the 2010s come out and uh, the processor, what I think, uh, as I was creating these slides, I think we have a, we're into a new era, uh, it's a processor revolution. And it's a new golden age. And a couple of things that are driving the need for processor design. Um, you know, you, you hear about Moore's Law and Denard scaling. And as those two laws are breaking down, we need to learn how to customize uh, cores for energy efficiency to the application. We can't just go with general processors like we did in the 2000s and, uh, or 1990s and 2000s the early 2010s. We need something specific. Now, if we look at risk five, is it's a open standard. And when I say open standard, it's a, a standard where the definition of the instruction set is available for everyone to use. There's no licensee, licensee requirement, so it's an open standard. And because of that, now everyone has the ability to 
become, to actually customize their processor, where previous to this point, all the architectures were closed. For example, the ARM architecture was closed, the x86 and NVIDIA, they, clo they were closed and gave a benefit to the market, but now we're in a new age where we need to look at customization. So, you know, when you take a look at the applications that require custom compute, it's almost endless. You know, I just have a few up here that I uh, uh, pull out some images, you know, like artificial intelligence, uh, even at the uh, edge for inference or even training uh, in the back room, robotics, electric, electrical vehicles. We have um, autonomous vehicles. We have drones, uh, space, uh, you know, uh, applications like SpaceX, smart TVs, right? I mean, your TV... If you buy a modern TV now, it is smart. It has a, a lot of intelligence inside it now. Uh, you, you got your phone. And I was actually interested when I was, when I was putting together this uh, these images, one thing I, I noticed that the number of images that are, are uh, possibilities have been reduced because the iPhone or all the smartphones has really taken over a lot of uh, previous applications. For example, most people probably don't even have a digital camera anymore has been replaced by the phone. Well, there's a processor there that's processing the image, right? Uh, there's a dict uh, they do dictation, right? You, you used to have devices that were, were, were for dictation. Well, that's done by the processor now in the iPhone. So all these different applications out there require processing. And that's what a processor engineer will be developing the products to actually run those applications uh, on them. Now, I almost asked this question is, the harder question is, tell me what tech company is not considering custom compute? When I say custom compute, once again, we're trying to optimize the uh, a processor for a particular application. Even companies that you think that are software companies might be looking at custom compute because they're trying to optimize the back room that actually does all the, their software, you know, uh, for example, uh, uh, maybe translation, uh, voice translation or imaging and so forth. Even software companies are looking at custom compute in their back room. Now, when you take a look at a processor engineer, you know, there's not really that many places that might have a degree called processor engineering, right? But really the three main key uh, degrees that can feed into or be, become a processor engineer are computer science, computer engineering, and electrical engineering. If you see up there, I have a combination of sort of hardware-based uh, degrees and software. And that is, I'm just going to pull this book up. If you've taken, you know, a computer organization class by David Pat uh, uh, class, you might have had this book by David Patterson and John Hennessy. Whatever version that you have, if it's MIPS, ARMS, or RISC-V, it basically says it's the hardware-software interface. So it's just a key point that processor engineering actually is a... a, 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 a a position that requires both software engineering and hardware engineering uh, uh, aspects to it. And if then after underneath each of these degrees, I just wanted to put up um, uh, what they are rated as when you, you graduate. And there is a uh, there's a lot of different places out on the web that actually rate uh, uh, degrees each year. And the first one I came up to was research.com, and it, they researched uh, or created a statistics on or, or their evaluation based upon market potential for employment and average annual set salary. And then they ranked uh, all the different uh, uh, degrees coming out of the university. And this is a uh, bachelor's degrees. And you can see that, you know, the top degree is computer engineering, which is probably the biggest focus for being a process engineer, but you also have uh, computer science, which, which was number three and electrical engineering, engineering, which is number five. So this is just sort of a reference to show you that it can be both hardware and software people can actually become processor engineers. And that uh, the job prospects are quite good because each one of these degrees is a, a required uh, type of degree that we're moving forward uh, uh, in industry and, and society. So the other thing I'd like to point out here is that when you start a career, it doesn't mean that you're going to be a processor engineer forever or a computer science engineer forever or a data analytic uh, engineer forever. 
certain degrees probably give you a little bit more flexibility of different things that you can do throughout your career. And I'm going to say there wasn't anything called computer engineering when I graduated, at least from uh, Penn State at the uh, 1985. But my first design was actually designing a floating point accelerator. So I'm going to say myself, I started as a processor engineer. And here's an example of my career. I started as a processor engineer. I did that at a very large co uh, company. And then I did several startups. Uh, then I actually switched into selling for a while. I became a business owner of the company I was working with. Uh, then I actually went and taught at the University of Colorado. And then, now I'm leading a university program at uh, CODASIP. So if you look at all those, uh, my career, they're all tied together because of the degree I got out of college, which was electrical engineering. So whatever career you take, um, processor engineering or computer science type degree or uh, maybe uh, kernel development, just want to point out your career can expand a lot of different careers and that can all be tied together with your particular degree. So that's all I had. I just wanted to give a quick overview of uh, uh, what, you know, processor engineering, uh, that th I think there's a new explosion because almost every company out there is looking for custom compute. And that's all, almost always based upon RISC-V because of the open standard. And there are, are some people are saying that there uh, is a, a lack of a, we're at a deficit of a thousand students per year moving into processor engineering every year. So the prospects of, Employment and, and work are, are quite good with that type of a deficit. So that's all I have. I think that's about my time limit as well. Hopefully I didn't go over. Um, but here's my contact information. Please email me if you have any questions. Uh, there's my LinkedIn information. And if you would like to learn anything more about the university program uh, at CODASIP, you can click on that. The university program is focused on both uh, the professors as well as the students. So uh, please uh, check that out if you have any interest. Thanks. So, Steve. I'll open up for questions. Yeah, and while uh, so feel free to put any questions in the chat. I I will say you know Keith, just to piggyback off what you're saying, it's so true. I mean, the number of people that we're going to need in uh, the future is is astronomical. And I just really hope that we can get more and more students getting involved in risk five earlier so that they understand it. And what I've heard from everyone I've spoken to, you know, cause we do have our risk five careers page where our members post jobs. And I've talked to a lot of hiring managers. One of the biggest thing they're saying is that get your degree, have the basic level knowledge, and then they'll train you when you get in. So, right. You don't have to have all the knowledge companies will train you once you get in, but you need to have the basic level knowledge to get in. Yeah. And I will second that. And I think it's one of the jobs of the university is actually to teach the student how to continue to learn. Right. Yeah. Because uh, in the field of electrical engineering, uh, the saying has been for many decades now that our technology is do doubling every two years. If anything, it's, it's uh, going quicker than that. So there's no way that in the university level that you can take all the classes to keep up to date before you graduate. If you think if I double this, your classes every year, you would never graduate. But our goal at the university is to give you the skills so that you can learn and be successful in your career long term. Totally. Yeah. And I just put a link in the chat. So we did create um, the Risk Five Fundamentals course and the Risk Five Foundational Associate certification. Um, the certification is quite difficult. So it's created for undergrads that are wanting to showcase that they have the basic level risk five knowledge. It was created by the community um, and is a really good way to showcase that you have that basic level knowledge. Um, so yeah, learn how to learn. It is very true. That's where we're at. Um, any questions specific for Keith now? And if you think of it in five minutes, just add him in the chat and yep. I'm sure he'll respond to you. I'll give one more minute for anyone that has a question. And then I will figure out how to share my screen. Well, thank you very much, Megan, for this opportunity. Of course. Um, uh, you know, I'm uh, 
uh, you know, one of my goals actually is running the university program is just getting more people excited about being an engineer and more specific about being a processor engineer, but just being an engineer in general. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's such a, you know, a broad, you know, RISC-V has so many different career types, which is why I wanted to do this type of a career fair um, so that people can really see what those opportunities are. All right. I will go ahead and play this. Let me know if you can't hear the sound. Well, there's no sound yet. <laughs> Greetings. Welcome to the RISC-5 International Career Fair. My name is Paul Clark. I work for Ventana Microsystems. Since this is pre-recorded, there's obviously no Q&A, so I've inserted some Q&A of my own. I hope you find it useful. I'll be talking about my educational background, my professional background, and um, uh, hopefully give you a little bit of pointers uh, as we go. Getting started, uh, from an educational perspective, I got my bachelor's in computer science and mathematics from the University of Maryland a long time ago. I got my master's in computer science from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute also a little while ago. Um, for a Q&A, do you have to go to an elite school and you know you probably already know the answer is really no um does it help a little bit yes um you know better school is going to look a little better in a resume but it's you know it's not terribly important i think the point is uh did you get the most out of your educational experience and what can you show about yourself on your resume and i think uh for getting the most out of your educational experience um, I think you should get involved, you know, go find some research to do, uh, get some work experience as an intern. Work experience in your resume is invaluable and it really uh, highlights uh, your, your capabilities. If you want to stretch yourself, I'd suggest doing a summer abroad. This isn't something I did. Um, I did do something like this, which I'll talk about in a bit as a professional. Um, but this really kind of shows your ability to succeed in an unfamiliar environment, which you're going to be in a lot. Uh, challenge yourself, broaden yourself, grow yourself as much as you can. Do you need an advanced degree? This is a very personal decision. I obviously uh, pursued and received a master's degree, did not pursue uh, a PhD. Um, I think a master's degree will give you some advantage over uh, a, a, you know, a similar candidate with uh, just a, a bachelor's degree. I pursued it just to kind of get a bullet on my resume uh, for my own for my own pride. Um, I'm not sure I got the value out of it that I wanted to. I didn't start it until I started my professional career. So um, I had to kind of squeeze it in. So I couldn't devote the time to it to get the most out of it that I really wanted to. So in some sense, that may inform, you know, going for your master's degree now before you start your career in order to really devote it, devote yourself to it and get the most out of it. Uh, but it's really a personal decision. PhD, I think PhD, my experience with PhD candidates is that, you know, the effort to pursue a PhD is uh, is a considerable effort. It requires a special person that's very dedicated. I think they come out on the other side different and, you know, stronger. Um, the only concern that I would have is, you know, that, you know, if your research area is in a particular area, that employers might, might consider that you're only able to function within that box. And that might be limiting in some regard, but I think if you sell yourself uh, as a as a, a flexible, viable uh, candidate, uh, that you'll you'll have no problem. And PhDs are definitely valued by employers. And if you have questions, it might be worthwhile talking to people that have these degrees. Did it pay off for you? What advantages did you get from it? And also ask potential employers as you're uh, talking to them, interviewing them, interviewing with them. Um, how do you and handle advanced degrees. What what benefit do you see in an employee having an advanced degree? Isn't it an advantage? And selfishly, what you know, what do you what will an employee get by having an advanced degree? And um, you know, you can also ask those potential employers, uh, will they help you get one after you start? Like I like I was able to take advantage of. Will they help pay for tuition? Will they give you time off? Could they potentially bring those classes to your site to make it very convenient for you? So those are things to uh, to think about. Um, my list of uh, jobs is is fairly short, although I'll, I'll I'll show in the next charts that you know working at one company for a very long time doesn't mean you're doing the same thing for a very long time. 
you know, I, I started off my career right out of uh, college with IBM and worked there for an extremely long time and then uh, kind of soft retired at the beginning of this year and found a wonderful job with uh, uh, an interesting startup, uh, Ventana Microsystem, where I am now. Let's uh, zip through um, IBM Crew Nettles. There's a lot here and I could talk for hours on this. I'm definitely not going to. Uh, the one thing I want to get for, I want you to get from these charts is that even though I worked for one company, I did a lot of different and very varied roles, um, all related to information technology and development. Um, had a long career there, started off in software development, was there for a few years, switched to uh, uh, it's more of a consulting role. But the cool thing here, this is my summer abroad. Uh, I spent a two year stint uh, on site in Paris, France, uh, working as a consultant at a, at a um, French company, um, making sure their products and our products work together really well. So this was uh, quite an experience. In fact, the same year I left, uh, to go to Paris, I uh, got married. I had a, I had a kid later that year. I, um, uh, you know, different language, different culture, different job. So huge growth experience, and it really changed me in a positive way as an individual. So highly recommended that you stretch yourself. After a couple of years there, I came back, started to work on this new technology called Linux, which kind of gives you the date uh, that IBM was picking up. Um, kind of as a team lead for a, a software development team, uh, and then switched to a more of a kind of a soft consulting role where we were just kind of solving problems as they arose, uh, kind of a SWAT team. We'd, we'd, we'd walk into emergencies and try to help, um, and then switched to a little bit more formal consulting role, led a two-person team, if that's a thing. Then put consulting and development behind me and became a performance analyst that was kind of looking at benchmarks and how to make things faster on the products that we're interested in selling. And then a little bit more back into software development, but as an architect, so a little bit more strategic thinking, setting the direction for the product. Then um, back into software development in earnest, but this time for open source software. So I found myself doing uh, things I was passionate about, open source and software development and getting paid to do it. So kind of a win, win, win for, for me. Um, and then uh, had some activities in a standards, standards body, the Open Power, open power Consortium, working to make their, uh, the definition of their architecture uh, more automatically usable downstream and automation is a, is a theme of my presentation as you'll find out in a bit. One thing I did in, 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 towards the end of uh, my uh, time at IBM was uh, a thing called a sustainability accelerator. This was kind of a reach for me, kind of outside my comfort zone. I was granted the opportunity to utilize 50% of my time for about a quarter, about three months of work to help a nonprofit, an external nonprofit, um, work with indigenous, indigenous communities in Atlantic Canada as the transition to renewable energy was happening in that area and they wanted a kind of a, a bigger voice at the table. And our mission was to just kind of find out how, we, how can we help make that happen. 15 strangers uh, trying to accomplish something in a very short period of time. So uh, uh, kind of a big reach for me and a good growth opportunity. So I'm excited to see how that turns out as it, as it continues. Like I said, I'm at Vitana now, a uh, very short stint here, less than a year. It's very different than an IBM experience. It's a startup. It's very small, several orders of magnitude smaller. Really, what I'm I've been doing for um, a lot of it as you as you enter any new role is learning, learning, learning. You got new technology to learn. You got new people to learn. New culture, new processes. All those things are a little overwhelming at first, and you have to give yourself that space and time to get adjusted to that to that new position. Things I'm kind of responsible for here include performance analysis, so I help with that, process automation, which I've talked about a little bit, and then my experience at IBM with kind of having more customer-facing roles gives me a, a little bit more insight into things like quality assurance and user experience. And another thing I'm doing is uh, that I'll be presenting actually at the RISC V Summit coming up in November is an uh, effort to exploit the documentation for the RISC V architecture and to make that automatically usable downstream so new instructions can get automatically incorporated into things like emulators and simulators and whatnot. One of the things I was asked to include was what is a typical day in my uh, experience here at Ventana? And really I have to say there is no typical day, which is great for me. I would not be good on an assembly line. Um, there's a wide variety of experience. Every day is different. 
Um, things are changing and I like that. Um, but things that do consume my time, software development, I write mostly in Python. I've been writing in OCaml recently, which is a language I didn't know at the beginning of the year. So that's kind of a new experience for me. I do a lot of software testing. We use Git to, to manage our things, probably like almost everybody does. And our processes are iterative and collaborative, kind of a, an agile fashion, if you've heard that word before. Uh, I do performance analysis, like I mentioned. I work heavily on automation and I'm learning, learning, learning all the time. Uh, and the nitty gritty side for modus operandi for large granularity things, we use email. For smaller granularity asynchronous communications, we use Slack. Um, for synchronous communications, online teleconferences, I'm sure you're all used to that. For document management and whatnot, uh, like this presentation, Google Workspace. And then for Git repositories stored at GitLab, so I interact with that a lot. And then this laptop that I'm talking on now, I got it. It was installed with Windows. And the first thing I did was install Linux because that's where I'm comfortable. And I think you should use what you work with, if at all possible. Become a user of your own product if you can. Career q and I'll go through these also quickly. Do you need to be an, an expert to be successful or as a generalist possible? And I think really it's a false choice. I think there's use for, and there's definitely, I'm sorry, there's definitely need for both, both extremes, um, but there's a range of things in between. So I think you, it's not something you even need to think about. Uh, find the things that you're excited about, you're gonna do your best work in and pursue those. Same thing for hardware or software. I don't think that's a firm choice. There's probably a, maybe a little bit more separation between these two concepts, um, but there's things in the middle like, firmware and hypervisors and performance analysis that kind of span both areas. So um, don't think you need to choose that. Um, try to spend most of your time on things that matter. You're certainly going to be asked to do things that have questionable value. And you might want to ask, how is this going to be used? And if it's not necessarily clear, you might want to, you know, either postpone it or ask, you know, does this really need to be done? Strive for efficiency. This is a kind of one of the underlying things in my uh, presentation that um, do things once and do it right the first time. Communication, know, know your audience, know what you need to communicate and do it completely and effectively as possible. And these worldwide teams that we're on now, you don't have the ability to have, have where time is overlapped so clearly and you may not get a response uh, except maybe one exchange per day, and that's very ineffective. So make sure you're completely communicating your, your requirements and expect a uh, complete response and vice versa, give complete responses. Automate as many things as you can. One of the things I always say is I'm trying to put my current role, make it obsolete while building the future role. Get those rote things automated so that you don't have to worry and spend time doing that and get to the point where you are um, uh, really working on the higher level, harder stuff. No two career, uh, I'm sorry, your career will not necessarily be what you like. Uh, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics says the current median tenure in a job is four years. I'm probably kind of the exception to that, having two jobs over many years. Um, but do expect that maybe you'll be changing things as, uh, as new opportunities arise. So keep your eyes open. Um, and as you change roles, give yourself enough space and time, as I mentioned before, to adjust to these new responsibilities. Another thing I would recommend is to actively manage your career. Don't just let it happen to you. Uh, seek out those positions, seek out those opportunities. And honestly, if you see gaps where you fit perfectly that don't exist yet, make new opportunities, sell yourself, you know, create that position. And sometimes it may be where you ask, uh, you ask for forgiveness rather than permission as you as you find a valuable place to be uh, where you can add uh, tremendous value to uh, the place you're working. Stretch yourself, stretch that comfort zone. And remember that as an early career, you're gonna be mentored by others. And remember as you advance to make sure that you are providing the same guidance and assistance to younger career employees. Be a mentor, be a mentor. There's nothing better than becoming a teacher to make yourself effective at what you do. And finally, uh, you know, find the passion that you have and find somebody that's willing to pay you to do it. I love software development. I love um, working in, you know, performance. I love Linux. And I found an ability and a position that combines all those things. And I get paid to do it. 
so it makes it, a, it doesn't make it a job. It makes it a fun. So I get to wake up every day getting excited about what I do. Do the same thing and you'll enjoy everything. That's it for me. Thank you for listening. Uh, my contact information there is there if you have any questions. And honestly, best wishes. Take care. It's talking on mute here. Um, I love how you really highlighted so many of the things that I, I pushed. So that was perfect. We didn't even plan that. Um, so I'll let, I know there's a lot of questions going on in the channel, but if anybody has a question um, that they're interested in asking live, Paul is here. So we're happy to, to do that. Otherwise, you can keep asking in the chat. Um, and we have uh, three more talks as well. So. All right, I don't see any jumping in. So maybe go ahead and ask in there. If you want to ask live towards the end, just let us know and that works as well. Otherwise, I will let this keep going on to the next talk. Hello, everyone. I am Rafael Oliveira, and it's an honor to be here today sharing insights about my short three-year journey working on the semiconductor industry. Well, I'll start talking about my background. I am currently an undergraduate student in computer science at the Federal University of Santa Catarina here in Florianópolis, Brazil. And I'm also an undergraduate researcher at the Embedded Computing Laboratory, where I am conducting experiments for my graduation thesis, basically working on the field of radiation effects on combinational cells. And my research is about uh, SET mitigation techniques for different full weather topologies. Well, I'm also a part-time digital IC designer at Chipus Microelectronics and head engineer of Osiris, which is a research group that I founded last year. I'll talk more about Osiris later on this presentation. Well, Chipus Microelectronics is a semiconductor company with proven expertise in the development of ultra low power and low voltage analog and mixed signal integrated circuits and SOCs. Uh, the company rely on a strong experience in power management and data converters. Chipus has more than 200 IPs for mixed signal blocks in different process nodes for, from various founders. And since its foundation in 2008, Shippos has provided IC design services in leading uh, edge technologies for our customers all around the world. Well, the company headquarters is here in Florianópolis, but the technical team is spread all around the country. But Shippos also has some offices in the US, Europe, and Asia. I'm fortunate to be part of the digital team uh, the, the team is very patient and right from the start, they have provided me with numerous opportunities to learn and develop my skills there. I also have great mentors that have been supporting my professional growth and helped me to understand the underlying of hardware design and digital IC design flow. When I started, I worked basically on the front end part where I did some RTL design, especially using Verilog. And I'm also working on creating test bent environments using UVM in order to simulate and debug our projects. Currently, I'm working more on the backend part, performing some placement and routing op optimizations, also performing some physical verifications such as DRCs and LVS in our design. And in some projects, I work on per, uh, uh, on time closure and ensuring that our designers are respecting the time paths. Well, but how everything started? Back in 2020, I was an undergraduate researcher at the Embed Computing Lab when the COVID-19 pandemic started. So thanks to the lab fast adoption, I was able to continue my work and my experiments I was performing at that time without any interruptions. And later in, in that same year, the professors from the lab 
decided to organize and host a virtual event. And the event was a seasonal uh, uh, school on electronic design automation. Basically, the event was dedicated to students and researchers in Brazil and South America. The goal of EDAS was to provide students with a series of lectures and key topics in the development of tools uh, for the automation of the integrated circuit design using and pointing uh, the modern and future technologies and including also lectures about uh, the current and the future challenges that are faced by the industry and the academia. Well, the aim of this event was to foster discussion on relevant topics and introduce also the, the main algorithms, uh, the computation methods used on IC design and artificial intelligence techniques uh, in the field and trying to attract new students and new researchers to the field. At that time for the event, Shippus Microelectronics was one of the event sponsors and shortly after the event, they approached the lab to establish a partnership. And later in 2021, they initiated uh, an internship program with their digital teams, which I had the opportunity to participate of the selection and join the team at the time. Through this partnership, I contributed to implement a digital IC design flow in the lab facilitating uh, that other colleagues and new researchers learn about IC design. And at that same, uh, at the end of my second year of the internship, I was invited to be part of the team and got hired in April of 2023. Well, but what is Osiris? When I was finishing my second year of internship, I was very excited about hardware design, but I want to go further. I want more challenges, but I didn't want to go alone. I want that other colleagues from the lab and my friends learned also about hardware design. So I decided to found Osiris, which is a research group and our goal is to empower innovation through open source risk 5 solutions and while designing risk 5 solutions i wanted that we learn circuit design and also we explore open hardware design tools and we are designing our very first uh, risk 5 core the, this core was accepted on an ieee program and we are hoping to go into tape out and have our very first core manufacturer by the end of this year. And in the group also, we are uh, working on uh, a digital IC design flow that we call Aussie flow. Currently, our team has five people, but we also have many interested in joining the team. Well, Besides all the technical information, I have a lot of hobbies that I always try to balance with my work and my studs. I love hiking, camping, and going out to skateboard. I try to do those activities because it's very good to keep your mind and your body healthy and also to lower your stress levels. So I try to, to do these activities in my daily basis on my leisure time. Well, I know that my path and my journey until now, it's not very common, but I want to leave here some tips. And the first one is about my hobbies. So it's very important to you to balance your life. So create some hobbies, go out and learn some sport or learn to play a new musical instrument but do not focus on just working, working, or study, study, study. You have to keep your life balanced and having hobbies will help you a lot on this. Be open to try new different things too. I design hardware, but I'm always trying to seek for the tendency in the software or other fields 
that can help me to look and to understand what I need to focus my learning journey. So be open to look in other fields if you are learning hardware design. Well, also don't stop to learn new things about what you are doing. If you are doing digital design, look into the tendencies, look into what the academia is doing, read some articles in blogs or read some articles from the conferences, but be aware what on what's happening around your field of work. And also be patient. In hardware design, there is a lot of things to learn, a lot of concepts and details to take a look on. So be patient, go step by step, and take your time to look back and see what you already achieved. Well, I think those are the tips I want to leave here based on what I've been doing and my short experience. That's what I had to present here for you today. And once again, thank you very much for the opportunity. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Leonardo, and I'm going to present my path to system software engineering. Uh, well, the classic Who Am I slide, my full name is Leonardo Braço Alves Passos. I work in Brazil at Red Hat, my Devere team. Uh, my main work is in the Linux kernel, trying to improve, improve CPU isolation and real-time behavior. And I also did hold, have this side question improving uh, RISC-V architecture code. Uh, in QML, I have uh, previously helped in improving live migration speed. If you want to find me by any way, uh, use this handle here, Leo Brass, in this, those networks, and you should be, it should be easy to find me. Well, let's start first introducing what in my vision is system software engineering. Uh, system software engineering is responsible for developing the base of computer systems for general use, meaning operating systems, compilers, drivers, libraries, etc. Uh, and it tends to fit on this kind, this category, uh, general pieces of software that are not applications, uh, as also known as the low-level stuff. Uh, usually, developing uh, system software requires deeper level of understanding how the computer systems work, uh, and usually I try to focus uh, on the Linux kernel, which is the most interesting piece, in my opinion. Uh, well, and that was my path. I mean, it was no straight line at all means. Uh, it all started as for everyone <laughs> when we are ch children and we have something that we want to pursue. And when I, I was a child, I always wanted to know how things work. And, uh, which means that I ended up disassembling a lot of objects at home and toys and try to look inside and try to perceive how does that work. Uh, to be honest, I was introduced to computers at 10 and they were amazing, but looking inside did not help me understand how they work at all. Um, then I tried to uh, go at, as work as a trainee in this computer store near my home and try to understand how uh, computers work. And there I got to understand how desktop computers were assembled and how to install operating system drivers and even do small PCB repairs, printed circuit repairs. Uh, and it was great for a couple of weeks. And when I had more deep questions about how the processors work, about how the GPUs work, people were not quite interested on that. And they actually try to say that um, we don't know and we will probably never know because this is some company secret. And I was quite disappointed at this point at computers. So I ended up looking for something that I could uh, understand better. Uh, and I started this uh, course in industrial mechanics. I was a teenager at the time. And it was great because I learned how to create very useful things in like still and even drive and draw 3D uh, uh, objects and it will be very helpful today uh, with uh, 3D printers. And But the main thing here is that I got a really good understanding of how uh, complex mechanical mechanisms work. And 
a lot of new things that I get to know in this course. And I couldn't understand because I didn't understand electricity. So, uh, well, I wasn't really sure about what to do in like for graduation. So out of this curiosity, I ended up uh, joining a graduation in electroengineering uh, at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And it was great because I got to understand how electricity is generated and how to is used to perform useful things, how circuits work and how to use those circuits for control, automating tests. It was very nice, very a lot of things that I got to understand there about electricity. And I also got to try like basic programming and uh, even started using Linux as a user. Uh, and I also had this uh, microcontroller programming class, which was awesome. Uh, because of this course, I started a undergrad research in Linux more plus uh, real time. At the point, I did not quite understand what real time was, but I thought it was really cool. Um, and it was on a small ARM board, 128 megahertz, 64 megabytes of RAM, and 512 flash megabytes of flash storage. And uh, it was very small, but it was good enough so I could compile upstream kernels uh, with real-time patch at the time, uh, create new root file systems, and installing base uh, tools for web development and for app development. Uh, for the other uh, researchers in the lab so they could create like uh, electronics that would measure something and send over the, the internet. And just for reference, that was around two years before the, the first uh, Raspberry Pi release. At the time, this was quite uh, new for, for the, the, the guys and I was quite interested at the point. Um, and then uh, as a... Uh, as a trainee process for the end of my graduation, I joined this uh, optical communications uh, research and development company, which uh, mostly uh, helped me apply the, the things that I, I got to learn in the undergrad research. And it also improved my programming skills because I was there developing firmware. The, the fun part about this one is that I got to, to learn different uh, technologies uh, like optional communications, microelectromechanical devices, and photonic, which helped me understand how light in a uh, fiber can help us achieve uh, very fast internet connections, right? Like today, at the time, they were not quite common here, but as of today, I understand they are an essential part in this, uh, in, our, uh, in our network. After that, I joined a company uh, for doing firmware uh, as an electronics engineer. And I learned about uh, a lot about uh, creating electronic devices, uh, PCB design, production of the, the, the PCB, the printed circuit board, and how to assemble the components on that. Uh, and it was quite interesting because I also got to learn more about system software since I was doing the firmware. And it was nice to understand how software interacts uh, with the system and how like how the boot happens, how the firmware starts running. Because since there is no operating system to help us or even save us when we do mistakes, uh, programming in those uh, systems is quite challenging. And it's quite good to, to get to understand because every bug that you have will be a big bug and you'll have to debug a lot and you, in the process, you learn a lot. So it was quite interesting. At the same company, I ended up parting two whole products between platforms, I mean, two different processors and modularize every software component. It was quite a challenging and interesting uh, task. Uh, I ended up advocating for using embedded Linux in the next company's product, uh, but uh, the company ended up uh, just, uh, rejecting this, and I ended up attending to this Linux device drivers course, 
which changed my career at this point because I got to, to do this programming, uh, this kernel programming, and it was uh, amazing how code was clean and how code was well structured and how it was, how the development process was. It was quite interesting. So at this point, I decided to change my career and like completely and become a Linux kernel developer and Linux kernel engineer. Which made me change company to this other company, which was uh, needing this embedded Linux developer. Uh, it was great because I got to work with embedded Linux, with, but it was kind of boring because it was application development. And to be honest, uh, even when we had to deal with hardware, it was too abstract, it should be fun. Um, and writing the applications was quite easy and boring because all the low level stuff was already done. And even though it's quite important, it was not my uh, my thing. So I ended up moving to IBM uh, in the Linux Technology Center here in Brazil. Uh, I worked with Linux on power architecture. And to be honest, in the beginning, it was uh, quite, uh, quite interesting because I did not understand most of this stuff. I was under the impression that everything that I knew about uh, computers uh, was wrong at some point. And I ended up learning that microcontrollers and processors like full uh, complex computers, like server grade computers, server grade power are quite different. And the, the server grade computers use uh, a lot more interesting mechanisms to, to speed up and to provide other features. Uh, in the end, I ended up learning a lot about computer architecture and like the, the newest things that I got to understand were virtualization. Um, I learned more about the kernel, privilege levels, how hardware is communicate like in a modern way and instructions encoding, cache, MMU, and a lot of new stuff that was quite interesting. Um, and I got to interact uh, with the kernel community, uh, which was quite a uh, and interesting to, to talk to people across uh, companies about a similar subject is quite nice. But every day, in the end, every day was a great opportunity for learning at this company. Uh, but so at some point, I decided to change another company where I could like learn more. And I joined Red Hat as a senior software engineer. Uh, my, my main work was uh, live migration at the start, but I got to learn a lot about the Linux kernel. Uh, I ended up learning more about pro level programming and how the locks, the inner workings of the locks happen and well, how real time schedulers work and how CPU isolation work, which is also quite interesting. And even uh, how is the kernel interface for live migration. I mean, it's quite interesting that you can just stop some machine, virtual machine and change computers uh, with the machine running. It's quite nice. Uh, at this company, I also improved my interaction with the kernel community because, uh, well, Red Hat is a reference and I got to know a lot of the people that I uh, would only know, uh, only meet by the, the mail list. So it makes my, made my job much easier. At the same time, uh, working at Red Hat, I ended up uh, starting a master's degree in computer architecture. And it was great because it helped me structure my understanding of how computer system works and even understand some rules of programming that only makes sense if you have a deeper understand of how the computer system under the work, we work under the hood. So, has been a quite interesting experience uh, working in this master degree. And might probably probably be about risk five because proposing stuff is much more simpler because everything in the factory is open. Well, so far for me, uh, system software engineering has been a nice career because it allows me to keep learning interesting stuff while I am working and proposing changes that is a, that those changes are able to impact a lot of users. Um, 
And also, it's interesting to notice that uh, my career path it was never a direct line, and none need to be a direct line. Uh, but the, the thing that kept me going is that nothing that I ever learned was wasted. So if I were to, to give a tip about a uh, career here, would be pursue whatever you, you are thinking it's interesting and try to do your best because uh, you'll probably go right. I mean, uh, you'll probably be going a, a nice work and people will want to get you. Um, so I think that's it. Uh, I hope to be able to answer any questions in the chat down below. So thanks everyone. Keep forgetting I have a little slide thing. That was great. And I totally agree. I know for I was a conference planner for 12 years. <laughs> now I'm a community director. So I do think that, you know, it's important to, to have that plan and that vision for the goals, what you want further down the line, but also to understand, you know, it's a zigzag. It's not a straight shoot. So love that um, overarching. Um, feedback. So I'll take a minute if anybody has any questions before um, we move on to Stephen. All right, then I will let them continue in the chat. Stephen, if you want to just, oh, where are you? There you are. Let's see. Can you hear see me or hear me? I don't know if this is working. Yeah, no, you're good. We see you, we hear you. All right, just give me a second while I share the screen. Let's yeah. just make sure I do this correctly. All right, how does that look? You ain't got it. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Megan, for inviting me here. Hi, hello, everyone. I'm Stephen Young. I'm the uh, Associate VP at Andes Technologies, uh, and I run engineering operations here. Uh, I've been a I've been involved in hardware development, design, verification in the CPU industry for almost 20 years. And in the audience is uh, Christo Backus, who is our in-house HR and recruiting specialist. That's her email here if you want to drop her a resume, along with um, the LinkedIn address uh, of our company if you want to know more about us. So today, uh, I have a general topic. It's less about me and more a little bit about what I think every engineer struggles with or is a problem that every engineer daily in out and daily in and out um, strives for. Uh, but we don't talk too much about it, and that's about quality. So uh, what is it about quality? You know, what, what is quality? It's um, what are the elements of quality? Um, to understand that, we've got to first understand what is the um, underlying goal here, right? The underlying goal is to make our products successful. It's to uh, build something that is going to gain some renown. Uh, it's going to be recognized by a community that's going to succeed in the market. And uh, one of those uh, elements is going to have to be meeting market demand. That's the features it possesses, uh, the offerings, and the price. No, nothing too complicated here. The next item is going to be the schedule, right? The, as the quote goes, you snooze, you lose. If you're too late to market, you, you're you not introducing anything new. If you're too early to the market, then uh, people don't understand what, you're, what, what is it that you're trying to sell. They That translates to risk, and most customers are averse to risk. There is uniqueness. Right? What is it that makes your product unique? I got something that other people don't. Uh, possibly surpassing expectations uh, or the, surpassing the competition, a differentiation through innovation, making my products faster, more performant, smaller, or lower power. Right? But great ideas don't come around every day. What does come around every day and what is going to be a constant struggle is actually quality. Now, that kind of goes without saying, right? We we all want high quality products. We all want to churn high quality uh, results. But what exactly is quality, right? We There's something about it. Um, 
everything before that, uh, market forces, uh, consumer forces dictate what they want, when they want it, how much they're willing to pay for it. Very few of us have the unique opportunity uh, to come up with a great idea and implement it. But quality is the one thing that we engineers every day have absolute control over. I'm going to even make a slight adjustment and say that it's the one thing that we are furthermore solely responsible for. Nobody's actually going to tell us as engineers, as experts of our field, how to do our job, right? We're, we're kind of the bastions of that, of that the pillar of quality. Um, and so much so that I guarantee you, if you talk to your boss, talk to the uh, other teams and say that I can give you a low quality product today versus give me a couple more days and I'll give you a high quality one, chances are is that they're going to wait for your high quality version. And why is that? Because the famous last words is like, nobody wants to approach a customer with a bad quality product, right? You, you do not want a customer coming back and saying that we don't want to use you because we had issues with your previously. Your quality is questionable, right? That's the worst uh, thing that uh, we could hear from the customer or from the community. So how do you define quality, right? It's can't, it's not very, it's not a number really. Um, it's, it's subjective, it's abstract, right? How do I, how do I objectively look at something and say the design or the test bench or the software program, whatever it is that you're working on, um, is of higher quality than another. So um, I'm trying to keep this very uh, simple. I don't really have any revolutionary ideas, and I just want to iterate on three or four things that may seem obvious, but given how important quality is, uh, I thought it's a good opportunity to uh, share my views on the topic. Uh, those three uh, items being clarity, correctness, and robustness. <clears throat> so clarity meaning, can it be described clearly and succinctly? Uh, have you worked in the team? Have you worked with other people? And someone asks you, uh, how does this work? And you're kind of stuck. You're kind of scratching your head and wondering, well, it sort of does it this way. It's like uh, ABC, but it behaves a little bit different. It's more like ABCD, right? Or you kind of, it behaves in a certain type of way, but I'll give you the details later, right? It's kind of like, even when I have to answer a question and I realize I can't answer it very clearly, I get frustrated, right? Um, th that's a problem. You know, we all work on very complicated systems, our processors, the software, um, or verification. Um, and when we work on a proper complicated system, we tend to describe it in a very complicated way, except that um, thinking that it's acceptable, but it really isn't. Right? Because if I can't explain something, then I really shouldn't be building it, let alone trying to verify it. Uh, <clears throat> oops, sorry about that. So what, what do I have to do, right? I have to disseminate a very big problem into easier components, digestible components, and then describe each individually, uh, making the whole solution actually easy to present. And that's actually very hard, but it's also what engineering is all about. Um, engineering is a process, taking a very large problem, dissecting it in very small pieces, being able to describe each piece clearly, implement the solution, and the summation of all the solutions becomes something very extraordinary. That's what engineers are good at. That's what we actually do day in and day out. So, you know, my recommendation is to uh, break down the problem. Use your block diagrams, circuit diagrams, uh, simple word text, flowcharts, graphs, waveforms to uh, architect the solution, right? Uh, work with your teammates, group reading, group discussion, read every line, paraphrase every line to make sure that everyone in your team understands and you understand um, the context. Uh, all the questions have, uh, that sh are asked should be answered in the form of a document. And all this transfers to a good external documentation that the customers uh, will appreciate. Uh, and in the end, um, they 
the better the customer understands your product, the better they can optimize for it. And working with the customer actually creates a better solution as a whole. When you put on the market, it becomes successful. And the next item is correctness, right? The design does what is expected to do. Uh, famous last words is pointing the finger and another guy say that they'll verify it or they'll cover it. And usually it doesn't work out that way. Um, it, it sounds like this was a verification problem, but it really isn't. I mean, verification, tr the process of finding bugs is great. It's extremely important. We use UVM assertions, formal verification, code coverage, functional coverage, assembly, software, different kinds of stimulus to root out every single bug, but also ask ourselves, what are you trying to do to prevent the bugs in the first place, right? Catching a bug is one thing, preventing the bugs is another, and it's even more complicated. So are you making the correct architectural decisions? Are you practicing test-driven development, unit tests? Are you challenging your assumptions about how something is working, right? Don't assume, actually go in there and take a look and validate your assumptions. Because honestly, no one else is gonna do it for you, right? So we gotta be responsible for it. And you know, the fact of life is we don't always catch everything despite our best efforts, which leads us to robustness, right? Is it resilient to errors? Uh, famous last words include, it will never happen. Uh, it's not supposed to be used this way, so you shouldn't do it that way. Or this is something that's been out on the market, it's been used elsewhere, it's legacy, it's used very often, and it's not going to break. Don't worry about it, right? And of course, it will break. Uh, so the bottom line question is, what if? What if it was used differently? What if times change and um, our assumptions when we were building the product is no longer valid uh, because we're, we're basing decisions and solutions on what we know today. We, we can't predict everything up uh, in the future. So what can be done? Um, a good designer, I believe, should provide feedback. And in anticipation of errors, it has to error out gracefully. Imagine you're the customer uh, the, or a user of the product and something crashes, but there's no feedback, there's no way to debug it, and you're scratching your head, what are you gonna do next, right? Uh, it's, it's not a pleasant feeling. Uh, and this kind of frustration will, you know, will quite damage your reputation of and the product. And always follow up and confirm our assumption when it's out on the field, right? As we said earlier, you, you, can't, you can't predict everything, you gotta keep track of, um, how, how the product is doing, how the uh, market, how the industry is changing, and then follow up into it, follow it up with your designs. So with the three items, right, clarity, correctness, robustness, accumulates to the ultimate goal of completeness. And here, it's not really a question about the product, but it's a question that I ask the engineers and I ask myself, are you content, are you content with the design the test bench, your software program, or in general, the results. Can you say, can you stake the reputation of you being the engineer, the one who's responsible for this, that there is nothing more that needs to be added, nor is there anything more that needs to be removed. It's perfection, the way it is. You can step back and you can admire and be proud of your own work, right? If you say yes to this, you know you've done the best job. It's the highest quality job that you can deliver. If you can't, and um, often I guess ask this question is, I think there's something wrong here, but I do, I really need to do it. Well, the answer is obviously yes, right? Go back and redo it, right? Why wouldn't you? Um, the uh, Any project, any engineering project today takes anywhere between six months to six years to complete. Uh, hundreds of uh, people working on it, millions of man hours why would you not try to push the best possible quality product out? And with that, um, you know, uh, I'm sharing another belief of mine is that a high quality engineer device delivers high quality products as there are parallels, right? 
we have to be careful when we're creating about creating correct content. We have to be clear about communication, execution, deadlines, and expectations, behaviors. And we have to be consistently providing our best results. In other words, we have to be reliable. Or even better, uh, we have to be uh, committed to our team and responsible for the project. So um, I think when you go on the field, you want to, uh, you want to get into these high quality teams, you want to be a part of it and you want to give up your best. And it's when a customer, a user, or um, even colleagues come back to you and say, I want to work with you, I want to work with your team. That is the highest praise an engineer can get. It's not about, in my perspective as an engineer, it's not about how much the product is making, how much money the product is making, which is nice, how much uh, marketing news is making, which is also nice. But for me, I get my most satisfaction when somebody says, oh, you did this. This was really good. I want to work with you. That's the highest praise. And that comes from uh, the quality of my work. If you believe in this philosophy, um, then I would urge you to come uh, check us out. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I, am, I work at Andy's Technology. We are a peer play. CPU IP vendor headquartered in Taiwan. Uh, we've been around for many years um, developing uh, RISC V uh, architecture CPUs, but we are expanding in particular in Canada and US. Uh, we have remote and office site locations currently with 10 positions open. Uh, to be clear, we're not a support and maintenance team. We're fully designed DB, UVM software formal uh, manage and management. Uh, we have a range of junior to senior uh, engineers, and uh, our positions are listed on LinkedIn. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Thanks, Stephen. I'll open it up if anybody has um, any questions they want. I've been trying to figure out how to save the chat. I'm struggling over here. Um, yeah, great talks. So much fun to have these. Um, I really enjoy doing these career fairs. I'm always just like buzzing afterwards. There's so much good advice and um, so really appreciative of, for everyone for taking the time to be here. Um, so if you have any questions, you've got almost everybody's email addresses. So you can reach out to them, find them on LinkedIn, look at the jobs. I mean, I, I love seeing what people are saying. You know, I think it was Paul that said, you know, even if you don't have all the qualifications on the job listing, you might have something else that they're looking for, and then they can train you on that. So, you know, don't not apply to things just because you maybe don't qualify for one thing that they're saying they want. Um, you really never know. So a couple of things that I wanted to go over just before we finish. And again, I will open it up and just like invite everyone to come on video Uh in a few moments. If you're interested in that, I haven't done this before, so we'll see how it goes. Um, but I did want to let you know about a few things. Um, you know, the Risk Five Summit is one of the best places to be to really make those connections. And Risk Five Summit is coming up here in a few uh, in a few weeks. Um, and I did want to let you know that if you are a student or a professor or you work in academic academia, it's only $179 to attend. Um, we're also having something called Risk 5 101 um, on Monday morning, which is free to attend. There's no cost for that. Um, and then that evening is going to be the member day. So as long as you're a member, individual, community, strategic, or higher um, you can attend the member day, which is another great networking opportunity. So I really encourage you to like get out and go to some of these events. You know, we have a risk five summit in China, uh, in Europe and in North America, usually in California. Um, and I did also want to let you know that the time has passed for this time, but we do offer scholarships to attend. And when I say a scholarship to attend, I mean, we pay for your flight, your hotel, and your conference ticket. Um, I will put in the chat, this is a video recording of the coffee chat series I did on that, which basically just talks about, um, yeah, how to, 
Yes, that's the right one. So the scholarship. So that time has passed for the one that's right now, but I just want you to keep that in mind for next year. Um, I do try my best to ensure that we're getting it out on social media. Um, I'm trying to create my own sort of like email list to let people know of these opportunities because they're not applied for enough. Like I cannot tell you, like I am hoping to go through hundreds of these applications. And right now I'm going through like 50, not even. Um, so please apply to that. We do look for people that are um, in the industry. So we go for diversity. We go for, um, and that's gender, location, um, things of that nature. So please do apply for these. It doesn't cost you anything. The application doesn't take very long. We do look up your GitHub to make sure you are contributing to Risk Five. Um, but this is this type of scholarship is what launched my career. So I'm very passionate about this. So please apply for these. Um, and so that will tell you a little bit more about that. Again, you can't do it for this year, but you can do it for the future. And, you know, we talked a lot about training. And so the other thing I wanted to, I just looked it up. Um, so right now there's a 40% off um, Prime Day. I didn't know that this was a thing um, that everybody does Prime Day, but evidently the Linux Foundation does Prime Day. And I just saw that they're offering 40% off all of our courses and certifications. And I looked it up and with the bundle of both the Risk Five Fundamentals course and the Risk Five, the RVFA certification, it's $179.40, usually $300 for both of those. So I just saw an email about that. So I'm going to put the link. Yep. So that's the code. And then the second thing I put in takes you directly to the bundle of both of those. Um, and, you know, I'm just hearing a lot of great feedback on it. So you can go in and look at the agendas, but it does expire tonight. Um, so I'm only going to leave this code for you all if you want to do it today. I will send out a 30% code uh, in the email once the video is uploaded and everything. So if you want to wait for that, you can. Um, and then there was one more thing I think I wanted to tell you about. Um, oh, yeah, here we go. So. If you do want to attend Summit this time, like I said, academic tickets are $179. Reach out to me if you have any questions about anything. Um, we are going to be doing two of these a year, one in April, one in September, I guess October this year. Um, that's sort of our goal for 2024. Um, but if you have any questions about mentorships or, or anything, I, I invite you to reach out to me. We're always here um, and really hope to see some of you at Risk 5 Summit. If you are going to be there, please let me know. I host a party. Happy to invite you to the party, which is um, like a meet and greet with our Risk 5 ambassadors uh, and usually has a pretty cool lineup of attendees. So um, if you have any more questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. But in the meantime, I think what I'm going to do is do breakout rooms since there's 32 people here. Um, so I'm going to split you into favorite number is seven. And just go ahead and chat in the chat rooms. If you want no um, pressure to stick around, you should still be able to ask questions in the chat. Um, if you aren't a Risk 5 member, you can join as an individual for free. I really encourage you to do that, um, whether you join through your university or your company or individual, because that's what gets you into the working groups. Uh, you can also attend, Keith and I run the academic and training special interest group, uh, which is a great opportunity to meet other people in universities. If you're a professor, we talk about syllabuses and other things you're working on. Um, so, but you can only join that if you are a member. Um, thanks, Keith. Have a good day. All right. So I'm going to try these breakout rooms and I'll pop into them, but I think just sort of like introduce yourself. Um, and let people know what you're looking for. What was your favorite topic? Just whatever you feel like sharing. Okay, ready? 